it's just a huge, huge honor for me to bring on the show Todd McGovern. He was born and raised in eastern Montana, the geographic center of nowhere in the United States. Todd admired his small-town dentist who sat weekly in the front row of his Catholic church wearing a dapper blue blazer surrounded by his camera-ready family. He grew up with six harmonious siblings as well as two supportive parents who, from an early age, put him in a position to be successful. At age 26, along with his beautiful new wife, Stacy, and his apprentice dental degree from the University of Minnesota, they packed up his pickup and moved to South Dakota to become the neighborhood dentist he esteemed to be his youth. Two years later, they resettled back in Minnesota Vacation Lakes country where Todd and Stacy are the parents to Matt, a business entrepreneur, and Dr. Laren, one of Todd's partners in Life Smiles Dental, a small group practice. Surrounded by world-class fishing, hunting, and golf, he engages in none of those. When not relighting lower dentures, he indulges in reading, fitness, travel to somewhere hot, and being in cahoots with his stud one-year-old grandson, Callum. Todd believes the fundamental keys to unlocking a career of dental happiness can be cataloged on a 3 by 5 index card. I love it. But you know what I love most about you? Let's hear it. That you won the spelling bee in the sixth grade. I mean, I don't know that that was supposed to be made public, you know, <laughs> but uh, anyway, thanks. And that was, you know, that was an accomplishment because that was a Sacred Heart Elementary. And it's not like I was the only one there. There was 14 people in my class. <laughs> hey, so, you know, uh, the reason good. I'm um, the reason, you know, I retired and the reason yeah. I came back and started doing this show on Monday is because, I mean, every day it's the same letter, email, DM, whatever. They're coming out of school. Todd, they got yeah. three to five hundred thousand dollars in debt. They're working for a DSO and they hate it. And they, they, um, they, the, the houses are expensive and they just, they're just not happy campers at all. And I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to come back and do this show on Mondays and I'm just going to bring in the studs of the studs that can talk to that young kid who's burned out, fried. You know what I'm talking about. So, I just like to try to keep the show focused on that. And by the way, that picture you submitted, I know you've always done marathons and I know you're an athlete and all that stuff, but my God, you look buff as hell in that picture. I mean, your traps are jumping out, your anterior shoulders. You look like you could be an anatomy specimen. Good for you, man. Oh my God. Yeah, I don't, you've been out, you've been gone too long. Um, (laughs) What do you uh, say to those uh, kids? I mean, do you feel sorry for them? You know, it's amazing with those credentials of mine that it's taken you only 1,700 shows to get to me. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I'm pretty excited to hear what I have to say today. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's all good. And I I, uh, I think that's amazing that you're coming back and that you do this. And you've, uh, you've always been such a, such a great uh, mentor to dentistry. And we're the same age and kind of got rolling at the same time. And... Uh, I was always amazed that you could get out there and start teaching people right away when I was still trying to figure it out myself. And uh, I started I started going to see you, Howard, when your uh, four boys were young and you dressed them all in like safari outfits. You had this picture that you'd show and they were just kind of lined up like this, all in safari outfits. And uh, so that was a few years ago. Well, you know what they, that what our, our, our criticism is from the young ones out of school that say, ah, Todd and Howard, they graduated in 1987. They graduated in the good old days. It's not the same. Everything they know is no longer true. And it's like, I, I, I think we understand the changes. I mean, I mean, don't you, don't, don't, I mean seeing, this, seeing this industry change in the last 40 years, I mean, we know what's going on, but what do you tell a guy who just burned out, fried, he's – you know, in debt up to his neck, the houses are high. I mean, he, he's just not a happy camper. How do, how do we get this this lady, like your daughter, she just come out of dental school. How you, how long has she been out of school? Uh, five years. It's a good five just, years? We'll be six. We'll be six. God, uh, it'd yeah. be cool to see how what all of her classmates are doing five years out. I mean, what percent are in DIA? So I bet that's a data-rich thought. Yeah, yeah, it's fun to, it's fun to see them. There's some, some great uh, classmates and uh, – we go to, you know, some seminars with them. I know several of them and, uh, and they're great people. You know, overall, what I think is that the, the generation behind them is going to look back at, the, at their generation and say, oh, my gosh, those are the good old days. I wish I could have practiced when <laughs> you were practicing, just like the generation in, in front of us did and the generation in front of them. There's always the good old time. I mean, would you rather be doing what we're doing 
or and uh, or have a normal job where you're maybe you go to school and you're forty five thousand dollars in debt and you're an elementary school teacher. Now, how are they going to ever pay that back? You know, so if you do this, if you move into healthcare like this and you're multiples of that in debt, at least you have the opportunity to go to work and try to pay it back. Yeah. And I don't think every, I don't think everybody I don't think everybody does. I think these are the good old days. I mean, I I worked all day today, had a great time, it went really well, and uh, I think um, I'm thrilled that my daughter decided to go in and do it. I think that her future is bright, and uh, but you have to make a few choices along the way. So, um, and another thing is, I mean, they 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 they're coming. They they're the average dentist now is making a hundred ninety thousand dollars a year. I mean, uh, my God! I mean, what what's wrong with having you're 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 all pissed off because you have a job that's put you in the top ten percent income in the United States, which is one of the top twenty richest countries in the world. I mean, come on! I mean, what what is wrong with having a job that puts you in the top ten percent and it's inside? You're not falling off roofs. You're not falling off palm trees. You're not out. You know, some deep sea drilling rig that explodes. I mean, I mean, if you if all you can say is, I'm in the top ten percent income and with an inside job with air conditioning and brakes. I mean, so so where where do you think that deep attitude comes from? Just the 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 big debt. I don't know about the big debt thing. I I think that maybe maybe their expectations are, are a little bit off. I I don't know what they did to get there. If if you work. I spent all my summers uh, in college and on working for the uh, city street department. And when you're slinging asphalt, you know, outside at a hundred degrees, I think every day walking down the carpet in our hallways, not a bad gig. You know, you get to work with great people and um, you don't have to worry about the weather, especially up here in Minnesota. Um, I don't know if it's that the expectations are too high um, if they're not afraid to take a little risk, you know, they want all the reward, but they don't want to take any risk. They maybe have gotten some advice that wasn't exact. If, you know, if you want to get out of school and you want to stay in the metropolitan area and you want to be next door to Starbucks in your gym and you want to work where everybody else wants to work, I can believe it's a little bit tough. Well, maybe you should consider making some other choices. You talk about this a lot. I mean, there's lots of opportunity out there. Well, maybe take advantage of it. So now, what that town was, are what town are you in in Minnesota? It's called Fergus Falls. It's about three hours out of the Twin Cities. Um, it's an hour out of Fargo, so it's it's rural. It is a rural practice. We're in a community of thirteen thousand in a county of maybe fifty thousand um, for our draw. But it's it's vacation lakes country. There's there's lots of other dentists in the area. It's pretty good. Um, you know, uh, area to be, it's a great area to live. It's an amazing area to, to raise a family and the population is good, but it's not, it's nothing I- I fancy, you know, 68,000 average, I mean, family income and, uh, average person drives like 20 minutes to go someplace. And so you have to be able to draw from an, from an area, but all the dentists in the neighborhood that I look around and see, everybody seems to be doing well. Everybody's happy. Everybody's got patience. Yeah, and what is um, and what what is the population, and how many dentists are in the town? So the, it's, the town's about thirteen thousand, and we've got about thirteen dentists. Um, half of them are in my practice with me, and but there's several other groups, and they're all good people, and they have active going practices. So it's not like we're necessarily underserved. So especially in our community, but we do draw. We we draw. We have. Probably, if you, if you take our draw out to maybe 30 miles each way, we're probably 40,000 maybe, you know, in the draw. But there's some dentists in the smaller communities around us, too. And you said there's 13 dentists in your town and half of them work for you? Uh, work with me. Or work with you? Yeah. Um, so, so now, um, well, well, let's go. Let, let's go. First, I want to address the 400-pound elephant in the room. There, there's no big DSO chains in Ferguson, right? They're all in the big city. Ferguson Falls, no. There's not, but there is within striking distance. What striking distance? Are you talking Fargo or Fargo, Far, yeah, Fargo's fifty minutes away. And an there's an Aspen when they when they can recruit a dentist in there. So so, so what's your what what are, what are your thoughts on um DSOs? Do you think do you, do you 
Yeah, what are your thoughts on DSOs? If they work for a DSO and they're happy, good for them. I mean, I know I know a lady that was a single mother with a young boy, and she's been an Aspen for 10 years, and it just worked out perfect for her because she didn't want to own the business. She had to come home and raise a, a child, and I think he's 12 now and doing great. Other, other people, uh, you know, they're they're miserable. It's kind of like my one of my sons, um, my youngest baby. He was working for a guy. He loved the business, um, but he just... 99% of all his stresses, he just couldn't agree with any of his dis- business decisions, all this kind of thing. And I said, Zach, you just have the personality where you're not ever going to be happy working for someone else. So why don't we just make the transition and get your own spray phone insulation rig and work for yourself? And now he's got a whole bunch of other problems with the business side, but he seems yeah. to have a good attitude about all those problems. But he had a really bad attitude when he had to you know, work for someone else. So... Like in your daughter's graduating classroom five years ago, uh, what percent of them do you think are happy being an employee working at a DSO? That's a great question. The ones that I've talked to have been uh, fine with it, but they most everybody uses it as a stepping stone. We both know that the biggest challenge for DSOs is to retain their dentists, right? Because people, uh, the new graduates come out, they see the guaranteed income, and they go for it because they don't want to take the risk yet of going out uh, on their own, but there's lots of opportunities. Uh, in my daughter's class, I only know of one that actually went out solo on her own. Now there certainly could be more, but there's only one in her social network that I know and she's doing great and really liking it. I think that's, I think that's a big, bad thing. Uh, I think it would be really tough to do, but she's doing great. I like DSOs. I mean, what a, I love learning from them. You know, you look at, you look at those guys. I think, I think that that one time when you were speaking in Minneapolis, I I, I think that uh, the Hartman guys were there when they only had like eight, eight. It was early on, you know, and you were speaking because you mentioned something about one of them in in the beginning of it, and I was scribbling down these notes and thinking, how could somebody have you know manage eight practices at the time? And now look at what they're doing. But that was at the beginning of that meeting, Howard. I met you briefly. At the soda fountain, everybody was standing there to fill up their cups, and you grabbed a picture, a big plastic picture, and filled it full of Coke to take it up to start to start talking. And right away, I thought, man, I'm going to learn some stuff from this guy. He doesn't even <laughs> wait in line for his cup. He just fills up. He just fills up the picture and goes at it. And it was, uh, it was great. And there, are, I read about the DSOs all the time. I thought at one time my goal was to have five dental practices in my area. Use the use the main clinic that we have with um, a dozen treatments and operatories. And then I wanted a a practice in a small town, north, south, east, and west. My dad had five grocery stores and I wanted to have five dental practices. Went around, looked at all this, spent a bunch of time looking at all these things. And the problem was I ran into one roadblock. I couldn't hire the dentist. I couldn't recruit well enough for dentists to move into a rural area even though that they could use our main practice as a hub. Now, that was probably just because I didn't have those skills to do that, but that was the challenge that I came upon because in the real rural small communities, there are guys and gals, their practices, they just close the door. Just, there's nobody coming to buy them, and they just simply have to walk away, and the patients, instead of going in their small town, now they have to drive a half an hour to our practice or something like that. But... If it, I mean, I think you sort of answered your own question with the example of that one gal. If it works for her, I think that's amazing. Good for her. And a lot of people, they don't want to mess with the whole business aspect of it, right? I mean, you like that part. I like that part. I read your early book on the business of dentistry and then your most recent one, obviously. But a lot of people don't want to have to deal with any of that kind of stuff. They just, you know, they want an eight to five, a well-paid eight to five. And if they dig it, that's good. Yeah, so I like them. I don't, you know, I don't have to compete directly against them, but I wouldn't mind. I'm I'm happy that they're not in my town because uh, of the advantages, the scale advantages that they have. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just their attitude. I mean, you know, it's not like they're practicing dentistry in Central or South America or Africa or Asia or any. I mean, they're in a rich, rich as hell country. They're the top 10% income, and it looks like they've yeah. got a degree in bitching, whining, moaning, and complaining. And it's like, um, you know, when you talk to the Heartland boys back when we met, um, they got burned in the rural for just what you said. They they couldn't 
You know, I mean, yeah. I remember the first five DSO CEOs would tell me on their rural boxes, 10% of them didn't even have a dock in the box on any given day because no one wants to go to that small town. They want to be in the big town. They graduate their prime time to find a mate. They want a Starbucks. They don't want to go to Ferguson. They'd rather go to Fargo. And um, and I, I've seen walkaways from dental offices just recently in New Mexico, Texas, Kansas, where some guy's got a rocking hot practice, and after three years of having it for sale, he just said, screw it and close it down. And, um, you know, they, they just close the door. So the, these kids, if they're really hungry and they want to be their own boss, th- th- there's plenty of opportunity. Oh, no question, no question about it. The two closest uh, DSOs to where we're at in Fergus Falls, both of them were closed for over a year because they didn't, they couldn't find anybody to come work those practices. And they're, and they were fine practices, great communities, but um, in a situation like that, why not join somebody, join a small group practice because that is the sweet spot in dentistry right now. Small group so, practice, small group practice. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was kind of the thing is that I believe that it's really pretty simple that on an index card, there used to be this thing by this professor at Princeton and, Harvard uh, a dozen years ago, and he, he wrote, he was talking on personal finance, and he said it really can be pretty simple, and I, I could put all, everything you need to know about personal finance on an index card, and somebody said, well, do it, and so he did in two minutes, put it online, and it's kind of a thing, you can Google it and see it, and that's why I thought, you know, I think I could do the same thing with dental happiness, because there just doesn't seem to be, the, the, the young crowd coming out seems so concerned. And I think you could do that same thing with, with, with dental happiness. And so I think it can be somewhat uncomplicated, just like business can if you learn a few basic uh, things. And it, it all comes down to relationships. You know, you talk about people, time, and money. I think it's relationships with people, time, and money, and relationships, including that with yourself. And that has a lot to do with it, too. In the studies, like the ADA in 2015 did this big study on happiness or satisfaction they called it practice job satisfaction in the practice setting they uh use large group small group solo and they sent out all these questionnaires and the easy winner was small group practice i believe that to be true i think that that's where it's at i think that's where you can have your happiest dental life is in a small group practice um due to the economies of scale and professional synergies and some of the things that, that you may not get solo or you may not get in a large group. So what we, on that, um, yeah, I love that. Um, on the, on the index card, Warren Buffett always said that he said, if, if you can't explain your business to him yeah. on a five by seven index card, he's not interested. And, and that's what I hate about these uh, 401ks. I mean, when you, you got the, it's, it's not diversification, it's dumbification. I mean, 200 of those 500 companies have never made one penny in profit. And I got to diversify into that stuff. I mean, why can't you just have a 401k of the top 10 dividend paying stocks? You know what I mean? Costco, Walmart, Home Depot, Chevron, Apple. I mean, but um, yeah, I uh, just pulled up that card. Uh, that, that, that is an interesting deal. So that's, that's essentially what I did was I, I, I just thought, what, what are they? Spent a few minutes, wrote down, came up with 10 ideas that I think kind of some, some of them are easier said than done. But when you, when you look at these, there was a study in your, the largest study on dental happiness was done. Unfortunately, it did not include the United States, but they surveyed dentists from 21 different countries and about all these things about sort of just general well-being or happiness is, is what they called it. And the, the dentist came out as only moderately happy. And I think, are you serious? All the time and effort and dollars you put in to become a doctor and you're only moderately happy? Well, go be moderately happy somewhere else. And they didn't have the United States, which I would have liked to see. But what country came in last? Iraq. Number one of the 21 countries they studied, Croatia. And, I mean, if I was in Croatia, I'd be happy too. You do a lot of things to be happy there. But I think that it's kind of disappointing that there's not enough gratitude for people to think that this is just a moderately happy career. Wow. You know, you get thank you letters for helping people. You know, if you're selling shoes, people don't write you thank you letters for helping them out. Did you see my uh, Twitter tweet I put about on Dennis Burnout? Um, Uh, Probably not. I'm not on Twitter. I'm just, uh, I said, 
why yeah. most dentists, this is real it's real short, why most dentists burn out? More than half of all dentists I talk to are burned out and wish they could do something else that is more fun, enjoyable, and fulfilling. This is almost never an option because of financial issues from debt and high-spending lifestyles that they don't want to give up. They feel trapped. We want dentistry to be more than it is and expect dentistry to provide more than it can. Dentists need to be humble in their expectations from dentistry. A job is designed to provide a service in exchange for money. What is wrong with that? It's Economics 101. Dentistry was not designed to be fun, fulfilling, your source of identity in a mansion in Beverly Hills. Your staff didn't get a job in dentistry to obtain a bunch of new best friends. We want dentistry to be more than it is, so we expect the patients and staff to be more than they are. In 2024, the average annual pay for a dentist in the U.S. was $190,000 a year, which puts you in the top 10%. What is wrong with having a job that puts you in the top 10%? What were you expecting? Do you know how amazing your income is? Everything else you need from dentistry you should have had before you became a dentist, which is also what you'll need after you retire. So it's basically an attitude. And none of the things they say make sense. I see it out here. We have two private dental schools, A.T. Still and Mason, Midwestern and Glendale, and they, they come out three to $500,000 in debt. First thing they do is they say, well, oh, I got all this debt. Then they go buy a house for for. 500000 or 600000 It's like, oh, I, I thought the student loans was a nightmare. So, so they go get a job, and they, they can't afford to open up or buy a practice, but they buy a home. And then they get married, and, and you know, it's usually a stay home, and she's going to pump out, you know, two, three, three kids, a frog, and a dog. And it's like, so nothing they're saying makes sense. I mean, if, if, the, hundred, if the student loans was really bad, you could live way below your means. All, almost all of them could move back in with their parents. I mean, my, my, my mom always begged all of us to move back in with her, and she, she loves it, you know. And uh, my gosh, um, so, yeah. So let me tell you this. Uh, be honest. Um, um, having your daughter work for you. I mean, so, so my, I had five sisters, and my, my dad had Sonics. And I didn't, yeah. my, my baby brother wasn't born until I was out of high school. Paul was uh, uh, what you call the Vatican roulette birth control method. And he was born uh, uh, when my mom was 41 and I was 17. And uh, so, um, but basically my, when dad would yell at me, you know, because of something at Sonic or whatever, you get all mad or whatever. I, I knew it was business. I knew it was work, but oh my God, my sister, they go home, they quit and they'd cry. And they wouldn't talk to him at dinner. And, and I, I remember, I remember sometimes dad would come home and sit down at the deal. And one of my sisters would pick up her deal and go eat in the backyard with the dog because he, he got mad at her that, you know, she, she left and she didn't refill the, the trays or she didn't do her job or whatever. And uh, so are you kind of walking on eggshells navigating? How do I have this happy father-daughter relationship that you don't want to mess up versus, you know, they're a partner as an employee. I mean, there's business and there's family. How do you separate the two? Who's the referee? Does your wife be the ref or what? How does that work? Uh no referee needed. It's not a cage match. It's uh, <laughs> having my daughter in the practice has been the highlight of my professional career. Uh, people hear me say that all the time. That is a reflection on her more than it is on me. It has been uh, great, easy, but also due to the other doctors in the practice too. Uh, my other my other partners, there's five of us that are partners, and they're all great, and we get along really well. Um, five is a good number to work with. That's uh, scientifically proven that you get a lot of decisions, work well. All Navy SEAL teams have five people on them, and we're not exactly Navy SEALs. Although one of my partners is an uh, Ironman triathlete like you, so there you go. And uh, having my daughter in the practice has been amazing. We work – I don't work full-time, um, and uh, we work kind of split shifts. We're there, we're there a couple days a week sort of at the same time. And so, no, it just – it's just not an issue, and and the the other partners are amazing about it too. I mean, it just it just I don't think it comes up. Just still. curious, are all the other partners boys, girls? Is she the only girl? Yeah, no, no, we got uh, three boys and uh, two girls. Nice. And, and Howard, we have a we have an advanced dental therapist, Jenny, who is amazing also. And so you add her into the mix, and one of my mentors, Dr. Bud who along with you and Gordon Christensen and a few other people were mentors to me. Um, he helps us out still a little bit too. So we have uh, sometimes up to seven of us uh, kind of hanging around, not counting the, the, you know, the uh, rest of the clinic team and patient services. And, and you know, I, I love that book. Who am I cheese? I mean, all animals hate change. They hate any kind of change. I mean, just, yeah. 
put, put, change your dog bowl. Just change your dog's bowl and he'll freak out. But the bottom line is, I remember, um, go back dental history. When they added hygienists, it was the same thing. They were going to ruin dentistry and only the dentist should do cleanings. Now people love their hygienists. Dental therapists came out. I mean, if you were pro that, you might as well have been a communist. Uh, I mean, yeah. you, you were a communist crazy man. And I, I don't know anybody who doesn't love their dental therapist. Well, where are you at on that, Howard? Where are you at on dental therapists? Well, I mean, my gosh, I go to Kansas where they had expanded functions a long time ago, and the dentist would um, have like five operatories, and they just like um, of not of clinical, not not hygiene. They'd have like two hygienists, and then like uh, I'd say three to five ops. They'd num 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 num, and then they go back and drill the MOD and the MO, the DO, the whatever. And then they go back in their office and and just play for half an hour. And since that dental therapist has an entire hour to do this one or two fillings. They're just artistically perfect, just like the lab man making your crown. But when the dentist is in there, who's the most expensive constraint in the office, he's trying to do them all real fast and he's all stressed out and all of that. And it says, my God, I mean, who doesn't want expanded functions? And I would rather have a dental therapist that when I'm done, the dentist done prepping, puts on a rubber dam and can just pour her artistic soul into this filling on one tooth because she has the time, the economics. It, it's just perfect. I mean, I, and again, I, I have not met anybody who didn't love their dental therapist. Well, they, they prep, you know, so ours is an advanced dental therapist. So no, they prep on baby teeth. No, okay. No, Bring us up today because no. you know, she she does restorative dentistry exams. She triages. I mean, she does the she does what's really tough. I mean, with young dentists, right? It's about it's about learning how to do exams, treatment plan, and triage. Now, Jenny was a dent was a dental hygienist with us for about ten years before she put her life on hold. Went back to two more years of schooling to become a dental therapist. Did did it for a year. And then took the advanced dental therapy course. So Jenny does exams. I worked with her today. She did a bunch of my exams. We have five hygienists in, in there. And it's it's hard to go down and get all those checks done when you're trying to do something. So she preps teeth because I'm in Minnesota. And she preps teeth. She feels it's embarrassing, Howard. When she first started, she would ask, hey, could you come in and take a look at this prep just to check it out? And, and I'll go in there. And, and her preps are better than mine, right? It's just like you say, that's what she does. She, she preps, she preps restorative teeth all day long and she's great at it. She does a really good job and her skills is diagnosing and, um, treatment planning and what should we do and triaging patients is, uh, has really come on a long ways. It's really fun to see how much she has grown from, uh, when she first started as a young dental hygienist. So no, she, she doesn't do crowns, doesn't do endo doesn't remove teeth other than baby teeth. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's great. She's great. Does pedo. I don't, I don't really do pedo anymore. Um, and so, but I still have pedo patients. So most of those will go to Jenny or my daughter, Lauren and, uh, Lauren and I use uh, laser. And so we do a lot of laser dentistry, especially on kids. It's Which another laser? place for happiness. Which laser? So, yeah. Which laser? Carbon dioxide? Yeah. yeah. Which one? So yeah. So lay a laser wouldn't, wouldn't practice without it. Just game changer. No question. Okay. I know you were, um, awarded. I mean, you're, you're one of the first 20, uh, university of Minnesota dentists who had an, an advanced uh, degree in, in aesthetic dentistry. And I know, I know you've always been big into aesthetics. Um, a lot, a lot of these kids come out and, um, I tell them they, they can't be a master of everything. You cannot master everything, but where, where, what do you think is the return on investment? I mean, um, you know, I mean, remember we, we lived through the Dickerson LVI cosmetic boom with bleaching, yeah. bonding veneers AHT stuff. Yeah, yeah, I did it all. I did, I did all that stuff until I realized it's, it's hard to make a living on, uh, on, uh, eight veneers in, uh, rural Minnesota. Right. Yeah. You would have thought I could have figured that out before I did it, but I really, I was glad that I did it all because it gives you the skill set, Right. I mean, look at all the training you did to get your MAGD, right? And some of that stuff maybe you did, some of it maybe you didn't. So it's nice to have it, but still, I mean, I'm, I'm very much in a bread and butter dentistry world. So what do you think a young kid, I mean, should they focus on endo, Invisalign, implants, or should they stick to um, bread and butter dentistry, fillings, crowns, 
young Perio, you know, um, what, what, what would you tell them to focus on if, if they're, if they're primarily obsessed with, they got this big student loan debt and they're not going to survive. Uh, where would you tell them where they could get a return on investment on their continuing education? The first is go to work, actually go to work. You don't have to work three and a half days a week. You can work five and a half days a week. Like I did, you worked even more than I did, but I worked five and a half days a week for years to build a practice. Uh, second is you got to learn how to treatment plan and do basic restorative. Definitely. Then when you move on Invisalign, right? I mean, Invisalign's going crazy just because they've got the system and the AI behind it. And so I think that's great. Every day, every young dentist is going to be placing implants. So you might as well get that figured out. I don't place implants. My partner, Mitch is very good at it. So we provide that. My partner, Jill, um, does Invisalign is very good at it. My partner, Mike does TMJ and sleep. Another area I, you know, that you might want to get some skills at. You don't have to know that much. Lauren does uh, laser and Botox. One of the so there's advantages to being in a small group. But to directly answer your question, I would get my speed up on bread and butter dentistry, and I would make sure that I have Invisalign and I start the implant placement. No question. Well, you know, you um, that was very very profound. I mean, we, you know, the old the old one plus one equals three. You know, I see a pediatric dentist open brand new from scratch and an orthodontist open brand new from scratch. Let's say at the end of three years, you're both at X. But if I see a pediatric dentist and an orthodontist open at the end of one year, they're three X. I mean, um, you know, if, if every time a pediatric dentist looks at a kid and says, mom's going to say, well, Billy need braces. Well, I don't know. Here's a referral slip to an orthodontist. Well, mom doesn't like that, but she says, well, let's have Todd come in and, and look at it and do the braces. So, so yeah. Um, I mean, look at when, when I was little, when you went to the grocery store, the butcher was a separate shop, uh, then the bread guy. And then the, there was a, a vegetable deal. And, and now the Kroger rolls all those things into one, everything's into one. So a group practice that has implants and Invisalign sleep. I mean, my gosh, that's a, that's, you're like the, the one-stop shop dentistry. That's massive consumerism, you know, you know, you know, um, yeah. And, and, uh, on the grocery stores, right. Because that's where my family's at. My four brothers all worked in the grocery store, you know, at one time or at one time or another. So when you think about where they should go, Howard, check this out. So two weeks ago, I met a really smart, sharp, young periodontist who's been out a few years. And so where do you think Perio's going these days, right? His practice, he pays the bills at his office with third molar extractions, next implants, okay? And he does some Perio. So if you're a periodontist coming out, you're gonna be doing, I mean, your, your world, who do, you, who do you want placing implants? An oral surgeon who's gonna walk in and say, ah, you know, I can get those, or take out teeth, I can get those teeth out with a golf club or periodontists who've been trained to think that gingiva is sacred. You know, I mean, those guys are pretty doggone good at this, but this guy is building his practice, a very nice practice. He's a periodontist, but it's built on a foundation of implant placement and third molar extraction. Well, there's somebody who's looking around and figuring it out. Yeah, adapting to the world. Lots of opportunity. There's lots of opportunity out there. So, so when we talk about demographics, I've been saying it for years that, you know, if Southwest Airlines lands in your city, it's probably pretty damn crowded for dentists. And, yep. um, you know, and if you're an hour away from where Southwest Airlines live, there's golden opportunities. So, and, and, and if you're in going into a big urban area and you don't know if, if a new office can open, a lot of times it's better to buy an existing because you eliminate your risk. Instead of saying, I think this will work, I think this is a good location, and invest a lot of money and don't know what's going on, you can actually buy an existing income stream where here's a dental office for sell and, um, you know, et cetera. So, so I, I want to go into... Um, you know, the, the DSOs, um, you know, one of the things that I wish would be easier, like some of these DSOs are saying, you know, they want their to reduce employee turnover, which is a plague right. in dental DSOs and not a plague at Walmart or CVS. I So many of those DSO boys have been telling me 20 years ago, I want to be, you know, the, you know, 80% of this market in the big cities is going to go to two people, Walgreens and CVS and, you know, um, Heartland, you know, Rick Workman and Toys. I know I'm Walgreens. And a couple others say, I know I'm CVS, whatever, whatever. But Walgreens and CVS, they, they keep their pharmacists for a very, very long time. And I just, um, 
um, you know, uh, some of them are trying to sell these minority partnerships, but if you own 25% of a business and, and your partner owns 51%, whoever owns 51% owns the whole damn thing. There, there's no democracy if you own, if someone owns 51%. And these DSOs, I think it, it, it'd, be not, it'd be so much easier if they were all publicly traded. So then they would be a partner, but they'd have something liquid because if you have a minority partnership in a dental office, you have a very illiquid um, asset that very many people would be interested in uh, trading for cash, hard earned dollars. But um, so back to, so back to your uh, uh, five people in your office, uh, are they all headed towards partnership for skin in the game? Do some people just don't want any part of that? Just want to be an employee. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, owner operated partnerships versus uh, employee associates. So I've, I've been very fortunate in that I've never lost an associate. I, we did have one that we helped find another job when she decided that um, she wanted to spend more time uh, having a family and didn't want the constraints of, of buying in. So, um, we did uh, find her another job. I tore up her non-compete, let her move across town, called up a friend of mine and said, hey, do you need some help? Because she was brought in to move into partnership because I believe in selling fractional partnerships and then bringing everybody on. So the, our two youngest doctors are currently in the process of buying in right now. And so we will be at five full partners in the practice, not necessarily in the dirt, but in the practice. Now, is this based and, on Rick Kirshner's mean and lean practice? Uh, do I know Rick Kirshner? No, I mean, I is, know, is, your, uh, is your business model, his business model of his fractional partnership? I, you know, may, maybe it's, um, I don't know enough about the intricacies of his. I just know this, Howard, that, that I would rather have partners with skin in the game because now, especially living in a rural area, now you're there. You're not, you're not going to leave because you're there. And it's too easy for people to come and go. And, and I have been so blessed with, with staff and my partners. In, in our practice right now, Howard, I have seven of my team members that have been, to, we've all been together for 30 years or more. Kudos. So, you know, it used, to be, it used to be that you would hire when you had a problem, right? You hire reactively. And then things started to get a little tough. Then you hired proactively, meaning that the right person shows up. Yeah, let's talk to them. And now it is shift. I believe that it has shifted to now where my focus is on maintaining the talent that we have right now. I don't even want to think about having more at annual reviews this year. My main thing was I want to end this year with the exact same people that we have right now. I don't want to lose one person. Having said that, I have a hygienist re uh, retiring tomorrow. Tomorrow is her very last day and she's heading off to retirement and she's amazing and really happy for her. But trying to find a hygienist replacement in rural Minnesota for her is going to be challenging, even though we've got 10 great ones. And so I think if when it comes to the actual doctors that why would you go to school for as long as we did to have somebody else come in and tell you what you have to do? I, one of the keys, I think, of our success has been that as soon as an associate doctor shows up, they're treated like a partner. I say we call them partners. We tell the world they're partners. People locally don't know. They're treated as partners. I would never tell one of my doctors what their vacation schedule looks like. I mean, that just rubs me totally the wrong way. First of all, my daughter tells me more than I tell her. But the other ones, too, was that, you know, if you've got something coming up that you want to do, go do it. You know, I think that that's an option, but in the world of, you know, you eat what you kill. If you're not here producing, it's going to affect the bottom line for you. So how long, not to be personal, but how long did you date Stacy before you married her? So that's an interesting story. Uh, we'll see if she, I will cut it. Down <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't want to get you in trouble. I, 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 that, that was the lead in yeah. to the deal of so, how long do so you we date? We knew each other, Howard. We, we knew each other. We knew each other in undergrad. And we were friends and uh, we were in the same social circle. And then, and that was in Montana. And I moved off to go to dental school. She's actually a dental hygienist. Uh, after two years of working in, uh, in an office, she moved to Minneapolis where I was at the University of Minnesota, go Gophers. And um, 
and we started uh, dating and were married uh, spring semester of my uh, last year because I was going to move her to um, eastern Montana, the middle of nowhere, and uh, till uh, she decided that we weren't moving to uh, uh, the middle of nowhere in eastern Montana. And that was that was a long that was a long time ago. So we settled on South Dakota. Well, how long do these new dentists come and partner? I mean, and work for you and date, and you all get to know that you have similar philosophies on dentistry and staff and humanity before you want to uh, lock them down and get married by being a partner. Yeah, I get it. How 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 does that work? That some some of the guys out there speaking or writing say that you should, you know, get somebody in and, and offer them partnership right away. I, I mean, I'll never figure that one out. So I think it takes a couple of years to sort of figure out if you guys are all on the same page. And then you also need to get your speed up enough so that, so we've only hired one dentist straight out of school. And that was uh, my daughter, Lauren. She was the only one that came straight out of school. Everybody else either worked somewhere else, had a GPR, uh, but had some had some more experience so that they could produce a little quicker. But you have to be able to produce at a certain level just to be able to so that when you buy in, you know, your income stream stays the same while at the same time, you know, you're, you're making your payments. And what would that number be? Because a lot of people. Years. Three to five. Three to five what? Years. No, um, a lot of people, uh, l- one of the big stress things in these young associates is they go get a job at a DSO. And they get yep. paid a minimum base pay. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's 600 a day or, or, or what. It depends on the supply and demand yep. of the area. By the way, our yep. international viewers, uh, the United States is not one country. It is 50 states. And there's a real balance yeah. of power between the states. Kind of the yep. opposite of the EU. In the EU, the Fed, the Brussels, is kind of a toothless paper tiger. And each each one of the, the country states is strong with the military. In the United States, it's it's pretty much a 50-50s. So so the laws in Arizona can be very different than the laws in Minnesota. But um, but they'll come out and they'll say the same thing. Base pay. I mean, I'm just reading the other day that a hygienist in San Francisco, you can't find one for under a hundred dollars an hour, a hundred dollars an hour. And uh, yeah. but but um, but a lot well, of them say you know, they got a base pay. <laughs> Versus 25% of their production or collection, whatever, higher. And a lot of them say, well, I'm never going to reach that higher because it's a high number. So I was just wondering if you could talk to that kid, like, what what would your doctor have to produce a day to make their buy-in payment and their income deal? What 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 daily number do you think something that they'll have to aim for someday in their productivity? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. You're probably going to want, I guess it depends on how much you pay. You're going to want your your speed to get up there. Now, everybody's fees are different too, right? And so we're rural, so you can come in, you can have a a three-surface composite from me, and you can go to Minneapolis and have the same, or maybe I drive down there and do the same thing, and it's going to cost you 20 to 25% more because that's the fee range. And and I I know that um, through our mutual good friend, Bill Rossi, and he helps me keep up on all of that kind of stuff. And so that would be the same. So you're, you're going to want to be able to produce at a certain rate. Maybe you want to be able to minimum produce, you know, 60,000, 50,000, probably $50,000 a month in my world. You want to be able to, to be up in the uh, $700 an hour range, you know, for something like that. My dental therapist can almost produce, you know, she doesn't produce that much, but she produces a lot. Um, and then so much of it, Howard, just comes down to, are you going to do it in, are you going to work two and a half days a week or are you going to work five days a week too? But if you're a young mom, you might not be able to, to come and spend, you can't spend the hours that I did when I was younger and that you did when you were younger. You just might not be able to, to do that. So I would say it's going to at least take a couple of years before you can get your speed up enough that you want to take a look. But the sooner you can buy in, bottom line, the better. You're going to be required to do some things, though. Now you've moved into management. Not leadership, you know, there's a difference between leadership and management. We don't ask our younger uh, owner doctors to, to lead, but we ask, we ask them to help manage. And there are going to be some, you're now going to stay there. It's not going to be so easy to pick up a move because now you've got ownership in what's going on. Yeah, having them buy in, skin in the game, that's the difference to employee turnover and long term. I mean, okay. There's no doubt. Okay. It's the same thing. They can't. 
anybody can leave. But yeah. you can give me 90 days if you want when you're an owner, but you can give me 90 minutes if you want. You're still an owner. You know, what are you going to do about that? Yeah. And they like it better too. I mean, it's not just for the current. It's not just because I want to, to sell pra- portions of my practice. You know, the other, the other doctors are involved too, but you just, everybody does better when they move into an ownership position. That is my view. Yeah. And, um, and again, the bread and butter dentistry, the first, um, say three years, first three years out of dental school, they're working at DSO, the first three to five years out of dental school, what does bread and butter dentistry include? Does it include root canal implants and Invisalign, or is that more after five? Oh, well, it's, you, you have to be able to do at least, you know, if you don't want to do molar endo, I guess that that's, that's fine, but you have to be able to do endo. You know, I mean, you don't, you don't see a lot of poor endodontists and it's a good service and, and it's a learning experience. I mean, you want to be able to do endo, you want to be able to do operative. Some of the challenges are you'd love to just, everybody just love to, to cut crowns all day, but you're probably not going to have that opportunity starting off in some place, right? I mean, down the road, I do a high percentage of that type of procedure because my patients have been with me for 30 years and I have a dental therapist and I have associate doctors. So I don't do a lot of restorative dentistry at my phase. But when I was first starting out, I was doing a lot of just basic, you know, MODs and DOs and quadrant dentistry like we used to do. I think one of the questions, Howard, would, would be this. What, what is your goal? You know, if your goal is to be an owner, should you spend your first four years learning how to do dentistry, working at, at a DSO? Not a bad deal. I think there's some great ones out there. And then go to, into a private practice, maybe a small group like I think the place to be is. Or would you rather come out of school and work in that small group for three or four years, learn the people, learn the culture, see if it's what you're wanting for you're still doing dentistry. You're still learning. It's not like these, like these young dentists aren't getting paid in private practice either. I think it's a bit of a smoke screen. Um, I think the best thing about D- if I was coming out, I think the best thing to me about the DSOs are some of the educational opportunities, right? I mean, I think some of them are amazing at, at, at you know, you come on, we'll teach you how to do this. We'll teach you how to, do this. I mean, that's fabulous. It, it took, you have to learn all that on, on your own, but there's look at the opportunities. Now, now you can just watch your videos and learn a lot of this stuff. But back in the day, you'd have to travel all the time, you know, to go see you and the other speakers out there, you know, if you wanted to go learn endo or whatever it was that you wanted to learn, you know, to, I mean, every year you'd go see Gordon Christensen or otherwise you'd go to dental hell. And so, but now you can, you can see him on your computer screen. Yeah, that's right. But he always comes to Phoenix. Day, and, he always comes to my backyard, Scottsdale, on a Good Friday every year. So I'll get to see yeah, Andy, uh, on you on Good Friday. But hey, I want to I want to talk some big number stuff. Um, you said you bought a Saleo. That that that's not a uh, that's an all tissue, all purpose, hard and soft tissue. What does that yeah. machine cost? Does your dental therapist use it? Is that a return on investment? Does that because you're giving up the numbing time, and you just start working when you would have? Uh, well, we'll talk about the Saleo because. Whenever the yeah. decision, and, and, and if you can um, bleed that into CAD CAM, because whenever the decision is going to be a hundred grand, you have their yeah. attention. So, Saleo, yeah. what was that? Was that about a hundred grand? Uh, 150. 150. And a CAD yeah. CAM these days, what, are, what, what is a Serona CAD CAM cost these days? Um, so, are you talking about scanning and milling both? Yes. Well, you can do it for less than that. Not, not, um, Serac. I don't have Serac. I use the Glidewell system yes. for milling in office. Glidewell, I, Glidewell.io. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Because they have such a robust AI now. When, when we built, when my partner and I, and Mike and I built our new office, uh, 14 years ago, we built a closet and had it hooked so that it was ready to put the milling unit in because I thought that Serac would be the thing to do. I wasn't hundred percent sure, but I thought that there's still problems with the fit and all that kind of stuff. Well, for 14 years, that cabinet, uh, all ready to go sat empty and just stored like bleach trays or something. I don't know. And now it's got the milling unit. It took that long until I, until I got sold on, on that glide wheel system. And I'm a big fan of doing it in office now. And but what did that question- system cost you? What did Glidewell.io cost you? 
So that's going, we were already scanning, so we only needed the milling unit. I think that was 55. Yeah. They Jim, Jim is, I mean, he's beyond a gene. He's a freakazoid. Oh. He's a polymath, you know. I mean, he's like he's like some of these guys that can figure, and he figures he's he's a step ahead. I mean, who runs a dental lab and thinks I'm going to figure out a way where dentists don't have to use a dental lab? It's like, whoa, that guy's like that's pretty creative thinking. So if and, you have, so uh, I, I, so go ahead. So you have the Saleo and yeah. the, the Glidewell yeah. um, scanning milling. Yeah, yeah. And, and you would are those sub, you recommend buying? Both of those? I definitely recommend scanning, okay, now. Um, I think that scanning and sending them to some place is fine. I don't think you have to have a milling unit. Realize, Howard, that we have, we have five dentists, you know, but not nobody works full-time, of course, but, but we see we have a fair volume to work out of, of – uh, of, you know, we have 800 patients a month going through hygiene, so that gives you a fair amount of – of of activity going on okay so if i'm a if i'm a young solo dentist is that's a, the answers are different for that person like would i would definitely start scanning no doubt about it would i buy a milling unit right away no not until you're maybe doing 20 crowns a month let's say if you're doing 20 crowns a month i ran the roi on it and i can't remember because ours was ours was such an easy choice because we have multiple doctors and it was just like, can we get to it? You know, you, you, you might do the, have the patient stay there and put the crown on, you know, in 45 minutes. But most of the time so far, we're not just because of our trying to schedule and getting to the unit. I mean, that, that thing's making some crowns. One of my so friends, they, one of my friends uh, does all their scans. And this uh, lab lady who works in a big lab, she comes yeah. in Wednesday night and does yeah. all the milling from the previous Wednesday. So they, they do two appointments, but their miller comes in and mills them all on Wednesday night after work. But, hey, I want to switch topics completely because um, okay. they, they want us to keep us under an hour. I guess when they come to a podcast and it's two or three hours long, people, you know, they, they go by. But um, insurance is another emotional deal. Uh, are you insurance driven or are you an American? Yeah. Charge your own fees. And yeah. um, international people, there's PPOs where they set the fee. And really, that's all there is left. I mean, even the indemnity insurance have a fee schedule. So give it, give us your rant on insurance and in, in a small town dentistry. So it's very difficult uh, to. You better be really skilled and have a boutique practice if you're not going to deal with Delta, right? Because they're the eight hundred pound gorilla. So in my world, um, not we are not metro. So in the metro area. There are practices, certainly they're up to 90% insurance and they're, and they're taking everything from everybody. We're not in our, in our practice, we are 50% insurance, 50% of that 50 is Delta. We, we only take a couple levels. There's the, you know, there's all sorts of deltas. So those are the only ones that we're a provider for. I've tried a couple other ones and back back out of them because they are gravy sucking pigs and they lied to us. And so 25% of my uh, patient base at the office is insur has insurance, but we're not a preferred provider. So they're required to, for full fee. And then the Delta portion uh, pays us about 77% of our normal fee schedule. So we also have a senior savings discount or a membership plan, which we're giving up somewhere in that same area. Um, so I can live with 77%. I don't like it, but it allows you to do other things that you wouldn't be able to do. And in a group practice, we need to. If I was practicing by myself right now at this stage of my practice, I wouldn't take any insurance. I'd be like the endodontist where you got to pay first before you even get move into the back. How come, how come the endodontist can do that? Well, because they don't have any competition. They're just, they've got patients wanting to come in. You know, when you live rural, there's only so many endodontists. If I was them, I'd make you pay before I touched you too. I think that that's good business. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't I, insurance if I just had myself to take care of. I, I think one thing to look at it is if it's 25% of your practice, you're, you're giving them a volume discount. I mean, you know, you might do a marketing campaign and get this one new patient. Delta comes in marketing, says, I'll give you a quarter of your practice so that they get a discount. But the, um, the, the thing about the specialty though, that, that really irks me is like in the Valley here, 
they'll, they'll pay like um, the dentist $800 to do a molar, but they'll pay the endodontist $1,500 to do a molar. And then if it goes to the board, you know, I was paid for a Ford yeah. Escort and they were paid for a Ford Taurus and they're saying, yeah. well, hey, Howard, where's the rear view mirror? Where's all? It's like, God dang, they pay you twice as much and you're grading my work. Give me the same yeah. amount of resources. Um, yeah. so it's because they can, they, I mean, they can, they can get away with it. So do I love it? No, but it does allow people, but you have to know what your numbers are. And, 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 and I know that you're a numbers guy too. And if you don't, if you don't have any idea what your quote overhead is, you can decide what all goes into overhead. And if your overhead is above what your, and if you don't know what your write-off is and your overhead is over your write-off, well, go find a hobby versus doing that or, or don't take insurance or, or do something. It's just that there are insurance plans that I look at the numbers and they're crazy. And then some other doctors that I know take them. And I say, do you realize, have you looked at those numbers? Do you know what you're giving up on that? And then, well, I, I don't really know, but I, you know, a family asked if we would take it or the, the, the teachers just got that insurance. I didn't want to lose the teachers. I said, well, that's fine. I, I get that, but you're losing money. So does your, town, does your town, is it big enough for all the specialties? I mean, do you have an endo, perio, pedo? No, no, no. We have part-time, uh, part-time, uh, surgery. We do have one pedo. We have one ortho. That's it. They, so did you ever people, entertain the idea of, um, having an oral loading up all your wisdom teeth and having an oral surgeon from Fargo or, or, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota come in? Time. Many times, here's here's what happens. I've offered several of them and said that we'll put you in one of our corner suites with a with a door. And unfortunately, the answer is no. And the, the reason the answer is no is that they the specialists feel that the other general dentists in the area wouldn't refer to them if they knew that or they wouldn't refer them like to our practice to be seen. I've had I had an orthodontist in for four years who practiced in my office. Um, and it worked out well for him, I believe. It worked out well for us. He's a great guy. And But there was dentists that wouldn't refer to him because he was in our building. I had a periodontist that we brought in, um, and she was amazing. And that was really a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of fun, too. But she, uh, she retired. And so one of the hang-ups with that, Howard, in, in, in smaller areas is that, um, you know, some people – the, the competition thing, you know, when it, competition, you know, that's the thief of the thief of joy and you should really just compete against yourself. And I, I don't know why you can't agree with somebody just because they chose the same profession and went through the same thing as, as you do. We're pretty lucky. Most of the docs in town are, are nice people and I get along with them, but having them, re, having one of their patients to come to our place to have uh, their wisdom teeth out wasn't going to fly. I think it, I wish they would have, but I couldn't get an oral surgeon to try, but I've been trying for years. So do you, are you still a client of Bill Rossi? I mean, does, does he still help you manage your numbers to give you, you know, your breakdown of your overhead and all, all that stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Bill's a good guy. He's helped me a lot over, tell, over tell the him, years. Next time you talk to him, tell him he's come back on the show because, uh, I mean, it's just amazing how you go into a dental office and you'll ask the person in charge of the schedule to answer the phone. There's like two girls up there answering the phone and scheduling. I say, okay, what is the break-even point today? They don't yeah. know. How can yeah. you schedule? I mean, and, and, and you know, until you broke even, um, yeah. and, and then when you break even, if you break even by lunch and come back and do the same thing, you got 50% overhead. And I've been watching, when I got out of school in 87, there were a lot of practice that had 50% overhead. And then yeah. 10, 20 years ago, they were all at 65. Now you yeah. routinely, after the pandemic, because of labor, hygienists, all that stuff, I mean, I routinely have seen labor drift from 20 to 22 to 24, all the way to 30 to 32. And, and the same guy doesn't know his break-even point. And the yeah. girls scheduling yeah. the schedule don't know. And it's like a guy like Bill Rossi who can sit there and tell you these are the numbers. This is what everybody's yeah. doing. I mean, it's just tell tell Bill it's time for him to come back to the show. But I, I think you're amazing. I, I just want you to uh, – uh, I'm done talking. I want you to just close out again. I want you to close to that kid who's listening to you on the way to work or they're on a treadmill and she just hates life. She hates her deficit. She's out of DSO. She's 350,000 student loan. She just feels stuck. 
You've seen houses get so expensive. I mean, I mean, you wouldn't believe how many but now, now private equity is buying residential homes. I mean, she's just not a happy camper. Do your clothes talking to that girl on a treadmill who really is just not happy. Well, it starts with gratitude, as a lot of things do. They should be very happy, one. I mean, if you can't be happy and be successful in the United States at this time, I mean, what do you, as a, as a healthcare professional in the United States, what do you want to do? What are you going to trade that for? I think it's, I still think that the profession is amazing, but you have to understand that and you have to move forward with that way. Some people think I'm going to be successful and by golly, Howard, then I'm going to be happy when they have it backwards. How about happiness first? And that's going to lead you to success. You really want to just spend a little bit of time thinking how fortunate I am. And I don't want to get into that whole side of life necessarily, but man, there, there's a lot, there's a lot of people. Everybody, every, all of their friends, look at that. That gal that's on the treadmill that's a dentist, her friends are envious of her. They wish that they, that they could, you know, and, and they should understand that. But you want to think through a few things. You, wanna, you want to try to help yourself. You want to understand, you know, what your practice situation is like. There's so much opportunity. There's, there's, there's plenty of people out there like me that are looking for talented young dentists and patient services representatives and assistants. And, you know, I mean, we're just really blessed. We, I'm just surrounded by amazing people. I would tell them to find some mentors, right? Like you early on for me, Greg Stanley. I went to Greg Stanley all the time when he would say, you know, save $5,000 a month and I didn't have $50 a month to save, but you can, you can do it. And I would just, I would, just a little plug for small group practice again, private practice. Think about it. I think they should go out. They should go somewhere that needs help practice at that. And uh, I think that, that it's, there's so much opportunity. Just don't go to a place where you're not going to do anything and you don't like the people because there's lots of great practices out there with lots of great people. Get get some mentors, get on it. It's, it's great. I've never, I, I've never been happier being a dentist than I, am tonight. I had a great day today. Great patients. I know my patients personally. My assistants are off the chart cool. And the rest of the team is amazing. I get to work with my daughter. Um, sometimes my grandson uh, comes and we hang out at the office. It just doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that. I think that they want to look at it that way. And they should listen to you because you've had this long figured out. But there's lots of opportunity. Thank you for letting me come on today. I really appreciate it. And uh, next time in Phoenix, uh, we're going to go out and hang out together a little bit. Cause I know there's a lot more you need to teach me. Well, man, thank you so much for all you've done for dentistry. I mean, uh, my gosh, you're a rock star. Thanks for coming on the show. It was an honor <laughs> to have you to come on the show. Nice talking to you, Howard. All right. Have a great day. All right. Tally hall.